Bandai Namco is keeping mecha anime alive. The company underwent a huge restructuring this month. Sunrise and Bandai Namco Arts have combined to form Bandai Namco Filmworks, a way of consolidating all of their independent companies under the Bamco name and this boring new logo. They'll still be using the name Sunrise as a brand, but if you meet an animator in the street, you'll find this pink rectangle adorning their business cards. I've actually been thinking about Bandai Namco a lot lately. Everything they do seems to have a caveat. They'll fund Elden Ring, the best game I've played so far this year, but that treatment doesn't extend to their development partners who are tasked with creating anime games, which end up half-baked as a result. Bamco Studios themselves will create Tales of Arise, an excellent RPG, but every time you sit down at the campfire, there's always that annoying DLC button trying to persuade you to stop having fun and get your credit card out. And of course, one of their biggest claims to fame is the Gundam series, which they've been producing for decades. Yet every mecha fan has to reckon with the fact that these stories aren't great because of Bandai Namco, but rather in spite of them. But before we can talk about my favourite genre of anime, this video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends, which is celebrating its third anniversary this month. Ever since the RPG's launch, the developers have been adding new features and content. These include the new Shadowkin faction, a tribe of Eastern warriors, a Hydra clan boss, the 120 level Doom Tower challenge, and many new champions. And for the game's birthday, they have new champions, artifact sets, and plenty of prizes on offer. It's a full month of special events and tournaments, and if you're a new player, you can use the QR code on screen or visit the link in the description to receive a birthday package worth $40, including these three champions and a bunch of XP items. Plus, both new and existing players can receive over $25 worth of gifts if they enter the code 3 years Rage in game. Anniversaries are always the best time to jump into ongoing games, so start playing Raid Shadow Legends today. It's available on Android, iOS and PC. And thanks to the developers for sponsoring this video. I don't talk about it enough on this channel, but my favourite anime of all time is Gundam Build Fighters. On the surface level, it's a story about two kids who enter a tournament where they fight with remote controlled plastic toys. But beyond that, it's a story about what it means to love something. Throughout the series, characters explore what Gunpla Battle means to them. Some view it as a hobby, others a connection to their childhood, or a ladder to success, or even a medium of abuse. Use. It's a truly brilliant show created by Kenji Nagasaki and Yosuke Kuroda, who were both later hired to direct and write the My Hair Academia anime based on its success. What's more, it's a stunning watch, with some of the best 2D mecha animation in the industry and a standout soundtrack. For me, it's a masterpiece, but to its producers at Bandai Namco, it was a toy commercial. And after Nagasaki left, it just kept going until now the mechs are in an MMO or something. Anime fans are used to watching anime that are not so subtly trying to get them to purchase music CDs, games or light novels, but Build Fighters feels particularly blatant. And I mean, of course it works. I own more Gumpla than I have space to put Gumpla, and Bandai has become the second largest toy company in the world as a result. But at the same time, it feels like most mecha series today only exist for the whims of one singular mega corporation. When Bandai swooped in to make the model kits for Gundam after the unsuccessful first broadcast and merchandise, they stuck to the franchise like a leech until they bought Sunrise in 1994 and later bought Gundam's co-producer Sotsu in 2020, giving them full control of the 
IP. In some ways, it can feel a bit nostalgic. They were making shows out of toy lines long before I was born. But you really don't expect it to persist today, especially in an age where animation is more popular than ever before. Sure, there are shows where they're hoping you'll buy the merch as well, and sure, publishers are funding adaptations of their works in part because they hope it'll boost book sales, but it's usually additional. It's also worth noting that while most anime use a production committee system to both mitigate risk and reduce the amount each company needs to invest, Bandai is regularly ponying up either most or all of the budget for Gundam series. Yet, even though it's streaming that makes up the majority of all anime revenue today, Gundam appears to care so little about that that they'll happily throw entire shows up on YouTube. And believe me, YouTube pays like shit. It's equal parts remarkable and unsettling. Yay, free anime! But do Bamco value the tales and tribulations of these characters, or do they just value the Gumpla ads in between that they're relying on to make back these massive investments? Of course, I think the creative staff absolutely do care. Gundam's creator, Yoshiyuki Tomino in particular, has mixed feelings about making shows for a toy company. He is thankful they've kept the franchise alive for so long, but also when asked about his opinions on Gumpla, during a 2009 panel, he reportedly said, Unfortunately, Unfortunately, I can't really make a statement on the plastic scale modelling kits, probably because I'd be eradicated from the industry if I made my true feelings known. I could relate while watching the YouTube exclusive Gundam Breaker Battlelog, a kind of spiritual successor to Build Fighters. Its purpose is twofold. It's an advertisement for the mobile game and an introduction for a load of new model kits, including the target exclusive American Gumpler. And while it's got cool mecha battles, directed by Masami Obari, one of the industry's most iconic robot animators, it's writing is a bit shit. The entire scenario was just outsourced to the mobile game writers, who had no experience in anime at all. Gundam still exists because of Gumpla. Even if the show underperforms, they'll always have these model kits. And now, it seems like they have a new way of selling them to us. Earlier in the year, on top of all the meta hype, it was revealed that Bandai Namco would be spending $130 million to create a Gundam metaverse. That's a decent chunk of what they'll be making from publishing Elden Ring. Details on this metaverse were the headline of the third annual Gundam conference. Not the Build Fighters anniversary project, not the poster reveal for Witch of Mercury, it was this. In fact, after getting a brief look at Witch of Mercury, the presenter didn't tell us anything about the story or who would be making it. He immediately went on to talk about all the merchandise opportunities and assured us that yes, you could scan your new Gundam aerial model kit and it would be added into the metaverse. They even announced a prologue episode, but before even telling us anything about its format or release, they'd already showed off the model kits they'll be selling for it. And so, I have conflicting feelings about Bandai Namco. I love Mecha, I love Gundam, I love Gumpla, I'm gonna buy all these guys. But the commercialization, the fucking metaverse, and the rebranding feels like a constant reminder that to them, the stories aren't enough. Would they have made a prologue episode if they couldn't make new Gumpla for it? I was surprised they were fine with the fact that Hathaway's Flash doesn't have all that many new mechs, but at least they can sell you the terrorist mask in the metaverse. Hell, even in their trailer they have a Zuckerberg watch a bit of the movie in a digital Times Square and immediately shout, I want to buy Gumpla. For Bandai Namco, everything has to sell something else. The pandemic boom of people bored at home thinking, well, I guess I'll buy an Exia, has spiked the company's future projections, and it all hinges on this $130 million investment. Gundam Evolution, their free-to-play shooter, will be a part of it, as will their online store, the most tedious way to buy anything. They're also not shy about NFTs, as they recently decided to twist their ongoing music project, Din on Boo, into a hotbed for scam artists and speculation, with plans to join public environmentally wasteful chains later on. Hard not to imagine that Gundam could meet the same fate.
I'm being cynical, but that's because it kind of is cynical. I can't trust Bamco not to turn beloved characters into NFTs, or to rewrite an upcoming movie to make sure there's 20 more mechs ready to be stuffed into Gundam Evolution loot boxes. Or sorry, quote, supply pods. But of course, unlike what some might believe, Gundam isn't the only mecha anime. But even so, most of the rest of them still exist as a part of Bandai Namco's system. In a couple cases, this is through acquisitions. A year after Actus finished Regalia The Three Sacred Stars, one of the rare shows with 2D mecha animation, they were bought by Bandai Namco Arts. And when Production IG decided to sell off Zebek, the studio known for the Fafna series, they were bought out to become the newly branded Sunrise Beyond, currently working on Kyokai Senki, another bastard of 2D mecha animation, even if the results can often feel a little underwhelming. The fact is that the ability to animate mechs in 2D is a dying skill. It's not exactly one of the things you're going to be taught in college. It's gotten to a point that when a show does have 2D robots, it becomes a statement. Studio Nexus's Grand Belm was created just to prove that it can still be done, with producer Takeyuki Nagatani asking viewers to watch it from a creator's perspective to understand the level of 2D animation talent that still exists within Japan. Preserving these skills is a priority for Sunrise as well, and exists as a stay over from their origins. When the studio was first founded, most of the market had already been cornered, so they instead aimed to monopolise a genre of anime that nobody else wanted to make. For a lot of companies at the time, mecha anime were thought of as difficult to produce toy commercials, and as the decades went by, it only got more difficult. In 2018, Sunrise producer Naohira Ogata made the bold claim that they were the quote, only studio that can make hands-drawn robot anime. It's not exactly true, but they want it to be true, and have put the effort into trying to preserve these skills. In the past, they've held animation cram schools, with a focus on learning to draw sunrise shows. One of Sunrise's current stars, animator and director Seijun Kim, was an early graduate. But even Sunrise admits that 2D mecha animation will likely end up as an antique, and the philosophy differs across their many sub-studios. Studio 3, for instance, the Iron-Blooded Orphans and Build Fighters lot, still largely focuses on 2D robot battles. But even then, there still aren't enough people who can draw robots frame by frame for the amount of shows that Sunrise wants to release. Yet, there's an overabundance of CG animators ready to take on that workload. Bamco today relies a lot on these. Gundam The Origin in particular was somewhat of a scary proposition at the time. Due to a lack of hand-drawn robot animators, they planned on creating the mechs in 3D. And that was still a scary idea to many at Sunrise. But the Origin team wanted to prove to them that the technology had improved and that they had a solid plan. And so, during the early phases of production, it was this team that worked on the Shah Toyota commercial and they used it to prove, both to themselves and any detractors at the company, that their vision would work. It was a pivotal moment, and while Origin can still look awkward at times, it's been a work in progress that's informed Sunrise's approach ever since. This new technology has also freed up other studios to try creating their own kind of mecha stories. Just recently, we've had Sakugan, 86, Back Arrow, all examples of the ways in which 3D has improved over the years. Personally, I was really on the side of 2D mechs. That is, until I watched Majestic Prince. Before they became known for their own shows like Land of the Lustrous and Beastars, Studio Orange was known for creating flashy 3D robot battles. Buddy Complex, Akito the Exiled, Fafna Exodus. It wasn't like they set out to become a mecha studio, but it was just what they were asked to do at the time. And so, they just got really good at it. But even when other studios get into the mecha game, they often still end up at Bamco's door. For instance, those recent shows I mentioned, Sakugan 86 Back Arrow, they were all funded in part by Bandai, with the goal of adding more products to their toy range. 
and maybe I'm just being paranoid about this, but are there mecha stories being concocted that are cancelled purely because they don't feature enough toys to sell? We already know that Cowboy Bebop almost got canned for that very reason. And if Bandai's engineers came back and said, sorry boss, the juggernaut plastic model kit won't work, would they still have funded 86? If the current kits don't sell, could that be the reason it doesn't get a sequel? It's all hypotheticals, but this is how mecha anime persists, pretty much the same way it has for the last 40 years. <laughs> Mecha anime will never die, but there are going to be a few asterisks attached. Number one, as has been the case for decades, the companies that fund these shows are going to prioritize their own toys above all else. But due to the rise in web media and how much Bamco seems to care about this metaverse thing, it's going to get more blatant than ever before and could include digital goods. Number 2. If a mecha anime gets released that isn't from a major franchise, treasure it. 3D animation has made these easier to produce, but it's still an uphill battle to get greenlit. You can't cheap out on them like you can with most isekai. And on that note, number 3 continue to appreciate 2D mechanical animation. People like Nobuhiko Genma, Hirotoshi Takaya, Seijun Kim, there's a small group of people holding an entire form of animation upon their shoulders. Eventually it'll go away. Eventually 3D animation will become so much more efficient and the technical skills will become so much more ubiquitous that it will be impractical to draw these robots frame by frame. But we can still appreciate it today. And finally, number four, the Gundam Hollywood movie is probably going to suck. But in the end, I still love Mecha. The grand sci-fi war stories, the contrast between a comfortable cockpit and the horrors of war happening just outside, the switches of perspective between two giant robots fighting and the people getting caught underfoot. SSSS Dino Xenon was one of the best shows last year. Hathaway was the best movie. Gundam Bill Fighters and Gurren Lagann are two of my favorite anime of all time. Voltron Legendary Defenders, one of my favorite American cartoons, or technically Korean I guess. So bring on the witch from Mercury and please don't turn Gundam's first female protagonist into an NFT. Thanks for watching The Canopy Effect. I've actually been wanting to make a Studio Sunrise Spotlight for about seven years now, and now that I finally made it, it's massively cynical and half of it's about a metaverse fad. Maybe we'll do it again properly in the future. But for now, I'd like to thank these incredible people for supporting the channel. In particular, I'd like to thank Alan Baccaro, Austin Hardwick, Chris Boylan, Dedemeet, Eddie Lehecker, Edwin Shale, Faux Wizard, Frizzy Canadian, Frog Kun, Fuji, Jacob Bosley, JR Pictures, My Own Mother, Naila Drink, Nolan Soga, Ryland Taylor, Tom Araman, and Tiago Nascimento.